The supposed post-war death of the city was confounded by the grand revival of cities from the late 1980s. These post-industrial cities, especially in the global cities of London, New York, Paris, and Tokyo, offered a different proposition to both the industrial city and the provinces. Against the sedate safety and security of the suburbs, city offers, cities offered opportunities to interact with a wide range of people, to find new ways of, li of living and ways of making a living, maybe exciting and prosperous ways. And against the industrial city, the post-industrial metropolis offered a wider range of jobs, but they tended to be more low-skilled, low-paid, and more precarious. But we'll get to that next time. In this video, I'm going to talk you through the rise of, cool, of the cool creative city, and in particular, cool creative London. The first theories of the post-industrial city were based on the knowledge economy. Daniel Bell had signaled the arrival of this post-industrial economy in his 1976 book, The Coming of the Post-Industrial Society, A Venture in Social Forecasting, which seems came out pretty well. By 1989, Manuel Castells, writing with John Mollenkopf, was comparing the rise of information and network societies with the Industrial Revolution in terms of significance. Ours was to be an enlightened society of knowledge work and information communication technology. Its future of this utopia was in the cities. Cities could thrive best, it was argued, by attracting high-tech industries and knowledge workers, otherwise known as human capital. The American urbanist Richard Florida had a different answer though. The key to reviving cities, he argued, in the rise of the creative class, was to attract a so-called creative class of workers. Those in science and engineering, architecture and design, education, arts, music and entertainment, whose economic function is to create new ideas, new technology and or new creative content. Florida argued that this creative class was now the dominant class in capitalism, or at least the class that created the most value. He argued that successful cities must organize themselves to attract these creative classes. Specifically, Florida argued that cities should create a specific people climate rather than a business climate. That is, traditional cities had attempted to either attract businesses or engage in substantial development projects. By attracting businesses, big corporations generally, often with generous tax breaks, they could create jobs. Equally, infrastructure projects like stadiums and roading produce working class jobs. No, said Florida, articulating strategy being sold all over the world. Instead, cities need to just be cool, and the creative classes will come. Businesses will then follow to find the most talented workers. As a result, city planners should shelve plans for an Olympic bid and forget about those tax breaks for Amazon. Instead, they need to fund their music scene, the local music scene, or encourage LGBTQ plus communities. Once a place has what Florida calls the three T's of talent, technology, and tolerance, the creative classes will come and businesses will follow. These businesses will come to find the most talented workers. As a result, city planners should shelve plans for an Olympic bid and forget about those tax breaks for Amazon. Instead, they just need to fund their local music scene or encourage LGBTQ communities. And once a place has what Florida calls the three T's of talent, technology, and tolerance, the creative classes will come and those businesses will follow. With people and businesses, tax income increases and infrastructure and public services can be enhanced. The city is, a, is revived with one simple trick. You may see there are some issues with this approach, especially if you're thinking from the perspective of the urban poor, and we'll get to that on the next video on urban inequality. And indeed, Florida's ideas have been met with as much skepticism in academia as they have been embraced by policymakers. Indeed, even Florida's most recent book on the new urban crisis suggests that he's having some doubts, maybe. So what does this have to do with London? If Florida was onto something, it could be seen in 1990s London. London had started to climb back from the brink from the 1980s, but much of its economic growth was based on banking and property. From the 1990s, though, London became cool again. Now, London had long been the place to be. It was in Georgian London in the 18th century that Samuel Johnson was reported to have made his iconic utterance, Why, sir, you will find no man at all intellectual who is willing to leave London. No, sir, when a man is tired of London, he is tired of life, for there is in London all that life can afford. Victorian London was certainly the place for people to be at all across Britain. And although dampened by the war, London rose again in the 1960s, with Time magazine pronouncing London to be the swinging city of fashion, music, and the sexual revolution. Deindustrialization took the shine off this swing, however. Crime, unemployment, and abandoned buildings are really cool. Unless you're looking for something edgy, something gritty, and something a little bit different. 
By the early 1990s, just as they did around the globe, young people started heading into London, taking advantage of abandoned industrial sites in East London to create a flourishing arts, culture, party scene, symbolised by young British artists like Damien Hirst and Tracy Emin. Newsweek and Vanity Fair announced that London was back. But it wasn't just London. It wasn't just that London was cool and attracted cool people. Perhaps more importantly, London became the home of what was called the creative industries, art, culture, media and technology. London continues to dominate the UK's art scene. If you're involved in music, film or theatre, there really is no choice but to come to London. London also hosts the dominant media industries, TV, radio and newspaper. And thus Florida's creative classes have flocked to London. And London, like most cities, have sought to enhance their creative and high school industries, creating cultural pro policies that are little more than economic policies. The UK's now Conservative Prime Minister, but in 2012 London's Liberal Mayor Boris Johnson, for instance, had argued that London acquired a deserved reputation as the greatest city on earth, a great driving, funkopolitan melting pot where, provided you did nothing to damage the interests of others and provided you obeyed the law, you could pretty much make of your life what you wanted. And that's why we lead in all these creative and cultural sectors. And that's why we have the best universities, because the best minds from across the world are meeting in some of the best pubs and bars and nightclubs, like some subatomic particles collide in a cyclotron. And they are producing these flashes of innovation that are essential for long-term economic success. Most remarkable, however, has been the association between London's tech industry and its creative scene. What economist Douglas McWilliams calls the flat white economy, after the favourite style of New Zealand coffee for those working in this fusion of technology and creativity. The flat white economy, economy is most evident in the area dubbed Silicon Roundabout around Old Street. Silicon Roundabout started as a joke, or at least the idea of it, with tech startup founder Matt Bidoff tweeting Silicon Roundabout, the ever-growing community of fun startups in London's Old Street area. The joke was that Silicon Roundabout feels very grey and very dystopian compared to the sunshine and optimism of Silicon Valley. But the reference to fun tells away the truth. From March 2012 to March 2014, the immediate area around the Old Street Roundabout saw 32,000 businesses created. Created. Given that most of these tech startups could be built from anywhere, this is indeed quite remarkable. While tech companies were building the technology that allowed you to work and play from anywhere, they were benefiting from the effects of clustering, where businesses in the same industry conglomerate in the same area. For the film industry in London, it's Soho. For finance, it's the city of London. For the tech industry, Silicon Roundabout was the place to get started and to attract workers. Part of this appeal is because highly specialised industries require complex networks of flexible specialists, so that a startup might need a specialised coder for one part of their project and would benefit from being able to use someone in the same co-working space. The other part is that London's tech companies benefit from the conditions of tolerance and talent that Florida advocated for. A community of like-minded people emerged and amenities developed around them. In particular, Florida's creative classes like to consume experiences rather than products that were location specific. This includes everything from foosball tables to escape rooms, ball pit clubs, and cat cafes, and other nerdier things, I suppose. Here, part of the appeal of London for the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial tech community was a sense of cool engendered in the East London area. Tech startups embrace street art and clubs. Counterculture was seen as all part of being innovative and breaking new ground. As Florida argues, capitalism, and the creative classes in particular, have captured the eccentrics and nonconformists, subsuming cultural subversion into production and setting them all at the very heart of the process of innovation and economic growth. Today it seems that there is no contradiction between cultural subversion that we might have seen in London in the 1960s and profit. Being cool is now good business. And London, the London dream, is built on this idea of cool capitalism. And that's what we'll discuss next week, focusing in particular on whether this combination of business, cool and subversion has, ki has killed the possibilities, or certainly dampened it, of social transformation. And we'll focus particularly on street art.